Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Those ads are from Emily's Voice ad campaign and Paul O'Rourke, who's going to be speaking to us tonight, is CEO of Emily's Voice and he'll probably tell us a little bit more about some of those ads later on. So my name's Sue Ford and I'm one of the pastors here at Mount Pleasant Baptist Church. I just want to welcome you to our final evening of Clash of Convictions series. It's been a great series and it's been so good to examine these very pertinent issues of our times. Every day that you turn on the news or you read your newspaper or you read something on social media, we actually encounter differing views on all these important subjects. Euthanasia is in the news daily and I'm sure that you would have even picked up that more so since last week when we spoke on that subject. Maybe a number of you read an article from Professor Doug Bridge and a number of group of palliative carers in the Saturday West Australian last week. I've put a few copies of it there, there, that, photocopied some in the foyer on a table just out the door, an Emily's voice table. I know MP Nick Garan encouraged us to engage with local politicians about these issues and I thought that article might help you engage in some way. So if you want to pick up one of those articles, you can. But tonight we consider the issue of abortion. Again, this issue is in the media almost daily. As with all of these issues we've been looking at, it's a highly emotive issue and it needs to be handled with compassion and love as Jesus handled every issue he encountered. However, as Christians, we are called to consider that what the scripture says about human life. Human life at its end, which we looked at last week, and human life at its beginning. Um, before I introduce Paul, will you just join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to talk about this issue of abortion tonight. We recognise that these issues we've been looking at are big issues, that they're emotive, but they're very important issues for us to consider. So would you help us rightly talk about the value of human life tonight in regard to abortion, that we might better understand how even unborn life is to be viewed from a Christian perspective. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So our first speaker is Paul O'Rourke tonight. He's from Newcastle. He's the CEO of Emily's Voice, as I said, an ag organisation using truthful, hopeful information, true stories and paid advertising to help Australians fall in love with the unborn and support women experiencing an unplanned or crisis pregnancy. Motivated by love for mothers and babies, Emily's Voice advertises in four states as a means of affecting cultural change and reaches five million people, including here in WA. He has a master's degree in holistic child development and has completed theological studies through the C3 movement. Before joining Emily's Voice, about seven years ago, he served for nine years as CEO of the Child Sponsorship and Advocacy Agency, Compassion Australia. He's authored five books, including three about the value, neglect needs, or three about the value and neglect needs of children. Paul is married to Janine, and they have three adult children and four grandchildren. So would you welcome Paul O'Rourke to the stage this evening? Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Sue. And uh, thank you for coming out tonight. It's not a fun topic, is it? Um, I don't like talking about abortion, but it's an important issue that we need to be educated about, but also speak very sensibly and sensitively, because it is, as Sue said in her intro, a very emotive um, topic. And I want to commend Mounties for daring to raise these issues, creating a forum for people to discuss these issues in a sensible and, as I said, a sensitive way. So what could or should a 57-year-old grandfather from the East possibly have to say in a discussion about abortion? What about the saying, no uterus, no say? <laughs> but if the entity in a pregnant woman's body is a person, a member of the human race, as distinct from a puppy or a foal or a calf, then surely his or her life is a human rights issue and not just a reproductive rights issue. 
I mean, wasn't it a male involved in the conception? Doesn't the child within the woman bear his DNA? If it's fair that he should pay child support if a woman chooses to continue a pregnancy, shouldn't he also have a say on whether the child is born or not? How is it that men are meant to be silent on this issue, yet more than half the OBGYNs and paediatricians are men? Is it okay for men to help women conceive, carry, deliver and also abort children but remain mute on the ethics of life? After all, most of the textbooks about embryology are written by men. Are men allowed to mourn the death of a child from miscarriage or stillbirth or SIDS or abortion? Does it at all stand to reason using the same logic that women should have no say in treating men's depression, prostate cancer, erectile dysfunction, testicular cancer? Surely if we're going to be fair, then they should have no say on these important issues. How do we reconcile these competing interests? How is it that a teenage girl needs a permission note to go on an excursion to the zoo but not to have an abortion? How is it that abortion is likened often to a tonsillectomy or an appendectomy? No big deal. Yet then we're told that it's a very, very difficult choice for a woman to make and it's never made lightly. I mean, let's face it, there's no movement called Shout Your Appendectomy or I Had One Too, yet they are the hashtags for the abortion movement. Shout Your Abortion and I Had One Too. How do we reconcile campaigns telling women not to drink or smoke during pregnancy? One popular recent campaign on the East said, when you smoke, she gets less oxygen. Should there be fine print like on the medical and the political ads that says, not applicable to those seeking abortion? Or how is it now that every state and territory except the ACT issues memorial certificates for children lost before 20 weeks gestation through stillbirth or miscarriage, to remember those precious lives. Are these children somehow more human than those lost through abortion, 95% of which are for psychosocial reasons? How is it that there's in utero surgery now performed on the tiniest of infants in one room and yet in another? Or how is it that abortion's promoted and justified as a remedy to um, child abuse outside the womb and to protect mothers from domestic violence. If that's the case, how do we explain that abortion rates have risen in parallel with reports of abuse and neglect of children? Are we aborting the wrong children? Why do we have publicly funded campaigns to combat everything from heart disease, cancer, the road toll, suicide, domestic violence, but not abortion? particularly when 70,000 annual abortions is greater than deaths from all those other issues we regard as Australia's greatest killers. I'm not going to tell you what's right and wrong tonight. I want you to think. I want, to th- I want you to think what, why you believe what you believe. I want you to think fully of the issue from both sides. So Emily's voice, as you've heard, we seek to restart and reshape the conversation about life using true personal stories. We're going to show you a short clip that explains why and how we do what we do and also some of the effects of of our media advertising. And it's not just a shameless promotion for Emily's voice, but you'll, you'll hear and see through the video some of the things that we're going to discuss tonight. So let's take a look. Emily's voice is a fresh voice for life. A voice of love. The sound of hope. We were only married four weeks and my wife told me she was pregnant with our first child. I'd left school and was living with my boyfriend. We were so afraid of having a child with a disability. Research shows 70% of mothers would have continued an unplanned pregnancy if just one significant person in their life had encouraged them to do so. Just one. Just one. Just one. 
Emily's voice is that voice of encouragement. Of truth. We're motivated by love. Love for women and children. We tell the real stories of everyday people. But being a dad's the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. Well, Jimmy's just so not what we expected. And I love being a mum. She's my life. A beautiful, positive, compelling media campaign. For women like me, I represent the one, one in every three Australian women who experience an abortion. I ended my first pregnancy so I know firsthand the pain of that choice. I can't tell you how much I regret that decision every day of my life. And I wonder if I'd seen an Emily's Voice ad or heard other people's stories, whether my choice might have been different. We need Emily's Voice. A voice to speak to every Australian. To restart the conversation about life. In a way that's sensible. Respectful. Empowering. And effective. I was 16 when I found out I was pregnant. And at the time, I was living in a women's shelter. I was definitely thinking about an abortion. I was barely looking after myself, let alone a baby. But then I got a little feet pin in the mail from Emily's voice. And I kept seeing the ads on TV all the time. I reckon I must have seen like three a day. I realised that if I didn't have him, I might always regret it. Today, I've got Oliver, and Emily's voice is a big part of that. We can all be Emily's voice. Because Emily's voice is a voice like yours. Tonight we're going to look at a number of issues. We're going to look at very quickly statistics. We're going to look at scripture. We're going to look at science. We're going to look at social justice or human rights. We're going to tell some stories and we're going to talk about supporting uh, pregnant women, those with an unplanned pregnancy and those suffering from post-abortion grief. And so with the stories and the support, I'm going to be joined by Lynn Scoof a little bit later. So what is, what is the issue? What is the clash of conviction? So I just want to kind of point out to you where both sides stand, if there are sides. And I don't think it's quite as clear-cut as that, as, as you'll see as we go on. But basically the pro-choice or pro-abortion, depending on how you want to refer to them, we all have labels that we love to throw out about one another, but basically the pro-abortion position is this. If we can just have that next slide that abortion is a woman's legal right based on bodily autonomy, my body, my choice. The pro-life or anti-abortion, if you want to label us that way, is best summarised this way. That abortion violates a child's human rights and, that it, and is a procedure that is not, not healthy or good for, for women. So pro-abortion advocates will say that a woman's right to have an abortion trumps any perceived or notional rights about the rights of the child in the womb. And it's very easy to bring different sides down to slogans. And so some of the slogans that the pro-choice or pro-abortion group use are these. particularly like the last one, keep your rosary off my ovary. That's a nod to uh, our Catholic friends. And so these are trotted out as kind of trite sayings about why abortion is, is fair and good for women. The other side says things like this. The last one is actually a quote by former US President Ronald Reagan. I've noticed that everyone who's for abortion has already been born. Uh, I also like uh, Mother Teresa's quote. Um, How can you say that there are too many children? That's like saying there are too many flowers. So the pro-choice position is, don't tell me what I can do with my body. However, individual rights are limited when they impinge on the rights of others. 
And that's, so that's why those who are pro-life will say, well, hang on, individual rights are not unlimited. And so that's why you can smoke yourself to death, but not smoke in a car with a child. You can't smoke in many workplaces, including a brothel. It's why you can get angry, but you can't assault someone, either personally or their property. You can drink yourself to death, but you can't drink and drive. You can dance naked around your house, but not out in the main street. So my argument, just being logical, not trying to take sides, is, hang on, we tell people what they can and can't do with their bodies all the time. Now, the pro-choice position, it's on a continuum. Some people are over here and some people are over there. So some people will say it's an absolute choice. Any woman of any age, for any reason, of any gestation, up to birth. Some would say, oh, I, give quali- I believe in qualified choice. And where you draw the line, if, if there's such a thing, is based on, who knows, but... It'll go something like this. Well, look, I'm okay with abortion up until there's a fetal heartbeat or I'm okay during the first trimester. I'm not so sure after that. I'm okay up to viability, which is, you know, 24 weeks. Um, And then in in the pro-life views, there'd be the same thing. There'd be an absolute view that I don't agree with abortion for any reason, Um, whether the woman's life's at risk whether she's been the victim of of rape, um, whether the child has some terrible disability that's incompatible with life. And then it sort of slides from there. Some people will say, well, no, I, I, I believe in abortion in some circumstances, but not not for financial reasons, not for career or because the child has a minor disability. And so what I want us to think about tonight is where do you stand? Where's, where's your line and what's it based on? What I will tell you very briefly is where the majority of Australians stand. There's been lots of studies done on people's views on abortion and they all come up with pretty much the same results by and large. And, and so this is what Australians, if, when there are surveys, this is what most Australians believe. Most Australians believe that ultimately, whether they like abortion or not, it's ultimately a woman's choice. Most Australians support abortion where a woman has been raped, where the child has a disability incompatible with life, or where continuing a pregnancy threatens a woman's life. Most Australians believe that abortion should be legal, safe, that is minimal physical risk to the mother, and they believe that it should be rare. They believe that women should receive adequate counselling, be fully informed of the risks, they should be given Uh, alternatives and they should be told about the development of the embryo or fetus. They believe that the counselling that women receive should be independent of an abortion provider. But here's the thing, that from 60 to 90 percent of Australians are opposed to abortion for 95 percent of the reasons that it occurs, for the psychosocial reasons, which are basically wrong timing which is too close to my previous child, Um, we've got two boys and we don't want another boy. Um, Most Australians don't believe in abortion for where there is a mild disability of the child or for financial, career or education reasons. And that's based on research others and include Emily's voice has done. We've surveyed 1,100 people in four states and the results are pretty much the same other than country people, so Ballarat as compared to Melbourne. Uh, Melbourne people are much more pro-choice than people from Ballarat. People from Bundaberg are much more pro-life than people from Brisbane. People have done it here. People from Perth are much more pro-choice than people from um, Bunbury. So as I said earlier, and you saw in the video, there's about 70,000 annual abortions in Australia. Those figures are derived from only two states that actually count abortions, Western Australia and South Australia. So I can tell you with more accuracy how many new cars we sold last year 
than how many women had abortions. But we know it's about one in three to one in four Australian women, and we know that 60% occur between the ages of about 20 and 34. Teenagers are not highly represented in, in the abortion statistics. They're about 8 to 9% of all abortions. Also said earlier that abortion is Australia's greatest taker of life. There are more abortions each year. If we go to the next slide. Compared with cancer, heart disease, smoking, suicide or the road toll. In fact, if you start to do the math, uh, it's, we have more abortions than nearly all those things actually put together. I don't think anyone disputes any longer that the entity in a pregnant woman's body is a human. It's a, ba it's a baby. We don't have fetal showers, we have baby showers. We're not expecting a fetus, we're expecting a baby. We're going to have a son or a daughter. Now, this is where we get down to the, the Christian versus a secular worldview. The Christian worldview is largely that, that we are made in God's image that God made us male and female. And one of the things that he told us to do was, well, two things, was subdue the earth or steward it, and he told us to multiply. So those of us with a Christian worldview believe that life is, is precious and sacred because it's been ordained by God. I'm just going to look at a very, just a few very quick scriptures. I'm not going to try and read them all. But in Psalm 139, David says that that we are knit together in our mother's womb. That we weren't random, that God had a purpose and a plan for us. If we go to the next one from Jeremiah, it says that Jeremiah, God says to Jeremiah, I knew you. I knew you when you were still in your mother's womb and I had a purpose and a plan for you. I had a specific plan for your life. The status and protection of the developing embryo is actually acknowledged in the book of Exodus. In all the punishments to deal with um, injury, they deal specifically with what happens if you injure a pregnant woman and something happens to her unborn child? And so we see that in the verses from Exodus 21, 22 and 23. It's a long one there, but it basically says, hey, it's, it's an eye for an eye, that the recompense that you pay is dependent on the injury. And so it's right up to you take the life of an unborn child, then a life has to be taken in compensation. Consider Jesus, the most famous unplanned pregnancy of all time, or at least to a bewildered Joseph, Mary, their families and the culture. And yet we have this wonderful picture of Mary visiting her cousin Elizabeth shortly after Mary learns that she's pregnant. Theologians suggest Elizabeth was about six months. And it says that when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and she claimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Children are always associated in Scripture as a blessing. So here's the rub. If you believe that life begins at conception, that has implications for your choice of contraception. Because some of the contraceptive pills and implants and certainly the IUD um, prevent implantation after contraception or fertilisation. And so therefore, by definition, they are abortifacient. They cause an abortion. Let's talk about science for a moment. We know that a baby has a, a heartbeat at 22 days from conception. We know that by 12 weeks, um, oh sorry, by three months, the fetus is fully formed. All the organs are in place. Nothing new develops. It's just that they grow and become more mature. At 24 weeks gestation, there's a 20 to 35% survival rate if the child is born. One week later, it's over 50% survival for a child born at 23 weeks. Very quickly, legally, a woman of any age can demand an abortion for any reason up to 14 weeks in the Northern Territory, 20 weeks in WA, 22 weeks in, 20 weeks in New South Wales, 22 weeks in Tasmania, and 24 weeks in Victoria. 
So abortion on demand means any woman of any age deemed capable of making an informed decision, regardless of whether she's scared to tell her mum or not. Abortion is available to term in most states and territories of Australia with the approval of a second doctor or a panel who can take into account a woman's physical, emotional and, in the case of Tasmania, current and future financial prospects. In WA, late-term abortion, that is beyond 20 weeks, is supposed to be limited to circumstances where an unborn child has a serious disability and or the mother's life is at actual risk. But MP Nick Goran has shown this is not the case in practice, with dozens of children aborted for cleft palate, turned feet, dwarfism and Down syndrome. So again, it's that how do we reconcile uh, this, this scenario? Um, Australia is a signatory to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. The UN Convention was crafted specifically out of the, the UN Declaration of Human Rights. They believed that a specific set of rights was, was needed to care, well, specifically for children. And so we're going to put up just a couple of those. That, and there's the preamble. So this is the overriding context for why they have developed the articles that follow. They say that children, by virtue of their immaturity, need special protection before and after birth. If we go to the next slide, it shows a, couple, a few of the articles. So Article 3 says that states' parties shall always act in the child's best interest. So I wonder... In terms of abortion, whose best interests are being served? In other words, if we got a group of children here, 12 and under, would they be pro-abortion? Article 6 says that every child has the inherent right to life. I just, so Lynn's going to take over now and talk about um, pregnancy support and some stories, and we're going to show you some videos, but... Just to end my section, I just thought that was, is a really powerful quote. Germaine Greer, for those who are a little bit older, probably over 50, she was probably Australia's first and greatest feminist. But there's her take on what abortion actually is, in her view. So thank you for your attention. I know I've bombarded you a lot to think about. Um, and I'm going to hand over to, to Lynn. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, Lynn and um, uh, Paul are just going to change over their um, mics so that we can record this. But it's amazing, isn't it, that confusion over life. I always think of that, that rightly we're trying to save children's lives that are born preterm, sometimes very, very, you know, preterm. We spend a lot of money rightly trying to keep children alive and then at the same time, other lives are disregarded. There's so much confusion about which children we save and which children we disregard. And we need to think well about these things. And that clip was just so amazing that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. It was just an incredible clip. So, so Lynn Scoof is going to come and share with us. Lynn is from Albany and she's driven down from Albany today with her husband Richard and she goes back tomorrow. So thank you Lynn and Richard for coming and being with us this evening. Lynn's been involved in the pregnancy support and post-abortion counselling space for 20 years and has various counselling qualification. She's the founder of Pregnancy Matters which has branches in Albany and Rockingham. Lynn's also on the board of Pregnancy Help Australia, a peak body established to support, encourage and train those involved in the pregnancy support sector. She's married to Richard. They have four children and one grandchild. So will you welcome Lynn? Thank you, Lynn. Turn it on would help. <laughs> Yes, I'm, I'm very um, proud and excited actually to be invited here to talk about something that's been uh, part of my life for a long time now. I'm very passionate about this area. But I'd like to um, preface this talk by letting you know that you won't be hearing so much from me tonight or about the work I do as much as about the women who've experienced abortion. And it's their voices that I want to share. So many of the experiences I read out tonight 
are directly from women who have had abortions. They've written their experiences from the heart and I'll be sharing them unedited. I think their voices need to be heard. If we're going to have an open and honest discussion regarding abortion, we need to hear from those who've actually been there. And as I said, that's been my passion for the last 20 years. I, I actually joined a pregnancy help group when I first arrived in Albany thinking, oh, look, this sounds like somewhere I could maybe help some women. Um, I had no idea actually what I was getting into. At the time, I had two young children and I thought, yeah, I can do a little bit of this. But I found that when I first started, it was a bit lacklustre for me and I thought, okay, is this all it's about? Until I got hold of a book called Giving Sorrow Words. I don't know if any of you read it or heard of it, but it's um, by Melinda tankard Reese. It's an Australian, Australian book with Australian stories of women who've been through abortion. So I, I read this book and I was absolutely shocked by what I was reading. It broke my heart to read about their grief and guilt and the ways that they were lied to in many cases. And I felt a kinship of sorts with my fellow women, even though I've never been through an abortion. So the seed was planted and the next years were spent learning from others, attending workshops, studying, attending conferences, and then working towards opening a centre where we could help pregnant women in Albany. And that is, again, it was a little bit of a twofold thing because as I learnt more about abortion and abortion grief, I realised that there were a lot of women out there who said, I wish I had known beforehand. I wish I'd known this. I'd wish I'd known that. So part of my thinking was if we can inform women beforehand, at least we can say you've had a, you know, you've been informed, you've had a, a, a bit of an information where you can make an informed decision. So I've had the privilege of listening to women as they speak about their fears in pregnancy and their struggles in decision making. And I've had the privilege of listening to women who have struggled after abortion. And I, I really want to be a voice for these women and they're often ignored, belittled or shunned. And I want to show you their heart, their pain, so we can understand that abortion is not an easy thing. And I also want other women and men to feel brave enough to voice their own pain and grief without feeling ashamed. And yes, men do suffer as well, um, but because for myself personally, I've mainly focused on women, I can't talk about men, and I won't be talking about that in this talk. So I'll start, and Paul did have a few statistics as well. Um, I'll start with that, hopefully this works. Okay, so this is, this is um, as Paul was saying, in, in WA we have some statistics, but this is from 2012 because that's the latest statistics we have. So just to give you an idea, um, 8,429 abortions were performed in WA. Um, I think it's really good to have information like this. Um, we have an opportunity in Albany as our centre to speak at high schools, to high school children. And one of the things I always ask them at the beginning, especially the year nines, is how many abortions do you think are performed, you know, in, in WA? And it's just interesting to hear their feedback, what they think. And every time they, know, they hear the real truth, they're, they're really shocked. And actually the teachers are too. So it's, it's a way again of educating. Um, and, and also for us too, as, as, um, as educators or as workers with pregnant women, um, it's also important for them to realise why women choose this option. So, the, the good news is the abortion rate has dropped. Um, and so, that is very good news. And the teenage birth rate is higher for the first time. As Paul said, teenage um, abortion teenage is not a big, big thing in our area. I don't see a lot of teenage girls come in. Also, another interesting fact is Indigenous women have less abortions than those from Western origin. And some of you might understand that, being from an Indigenous culture or knowing a bit about their culture, that they value life, um, especially children. So that, has, that does make a big difference there too. So I've written most abortions in, in WA occur in the 20 to 29 year old age range. That's also because that's usually when there's more women getting pregnant, obviously. And 2.6 of all abortions were carried out for suspected or identified fetal abnormalities. And as Paul said, so like 95%, well in this case 97%, are carry, uh, carried out for no reason. That's what it says in the report. But really, we're talking psychosomatic reasons, as we mentioned before. So one of the 
the things that, as an organisation, we sort of looked at was to realise and understand the, the pressures that women face when, they're, when they find themselves in an unexpected pregnancy and to understand the reasons why men and women consider abortion. That's obviously going to be the best thing to look at, to have your eyes open to see why, so we can, so we can perhaps combat some of these reasons. So this is um, research from um, Women's Forum Australia. So according to their research, the following factors may underline an abortion decision. So we've got a lack of emotional, social and material support. Um, that is generally one of the biggest reasons. Um, interestingly, the pregnancy is not necessarily unintended or unwanted. Women may be ambivalent about their pregnancy, so they may be half all right with it and, and not sure. Um, and let's be honest, even if we are expecting or we're not really prepared for a pregnancy but we find ourselves pregnant and we might be half excited and nervous, That's, it's a normal reaction. Um, but unfortunately, I think because we are in a society where the choice is so easy, um, if somebody says, I'm not sure, the first comment is, well, you can have an abortion. Um, even at doctor's surgeries, I've heard a lot of women talk about going to the doctor and saying to the doctor, am I pregnant? Doctor's saying, yeah. And the doctor's first comment is, are you happy about that? Instead of saying, congratulations, wonderful news, their first question is, is this what you want? And if not, how can we help you with that? So ra rather than the positive, they're coming up with the negative. So a, a substantial number of women undergo abortion while actually being morally opposed to it. And then there's the financial concerns, uh, and many women believe that continuing the pregnancy will jeopardise their plans for work and study. There's definitely concern about being single mothers. Now, this next one, feeling pressured by significant people in their lives, that, that's actually a big one, and, and in some cases we call that coercion, where we feel that the, um, the woman is actually being really, really pushed and encouraged to have an abortion. And relatively few abortions occur for reasons of fetal disability, as we've seen. So there's also another little thing I wanted to touch on, and I think, Paul, you touched on it too, that, you know, there's a bit of a, a common notion that abortion will prevent unwanted children, and that if abortion is stopped, there would be a lot more foster children than there already are. Um, now, well, for me, look, you'd have to prove that. It's very hard to prove that. But also, in my experience, as a, someone who's been working in this area for 20 years, I've actually never, ever had a woman who's, who's a drug addict come seeking abortion. I've never had a woman on the poverty line coming looking for an abortion. Um, I've never had an unfit mother looking for an abortion. They're not the ones looking for abortions. They're often the ones who will continue their pregnancy, often, even, especially if they're drug addict or alcohol addictions, they don't even think about the pregnancy, they don't even care about it. And they're the ones who end up with their children in foster care. It's not something I have seen at all in this area. Now, I just was going to show you this short video, um, it's actually from Paul, um, to show you a little bit about coercion and being pressured into abortion. So I want you to, yeah, just pay particular attention to her, to her words. When I first found out I was pregnant, I didn't believe in abortion, so I said to myself I was going to do this alone, I was going to keep the baby. I went and got all the checks done, medical checks done, so I found out um, I was having a boy, his name was Noah. And yeah, I was just excited to go through the journey of being a pregnant woman, so I planned a baby shower and told on my friends and family, like any normal person. It didn't hit him until I was showing and I had ultrasound photos. He wouldn't accept the fact that there was going to be a child. So basically, that he didn't want anything to do with the baby and I accepted that. I was going to do it on my own. He started to panic. He got other people involved and it wasn't just his parents. He'd get people from his club to contact me and tell me that I was incapable of raising the child. I was just constantly being blocked by him and then just having to deal with everyone else around him. He got Lou to constantly call me and offer me money and it wasn't like in a nice way. It wasn't like, hey, you know, we want to come and like give you money. It's more like get rid of this baby now, sign a confidentiality agreement and never talk about it again, not let anybody know about this. So throwing me under the bus and being all hush-hush about it. 
Every time I spoke to Lou, it was just about me not being able to raise the baby on my own. He would constantly tell me that, you know, be an embarrassment, that the father of the baby was an NRL star and that I'd have like a public shaming because I'd work in media and then I'd have to go through court and through the media and it was just going to be all public. He said that it's not a baby until it's born. You know, abortion's normal and people get it done all the time so, and that it was just a mistake and that I didn't have to have this baby. When they offered me a substantial amount of money, for me it was like, you know what, I can just start a new life and I don't have to deal with this ever again. When I went through the procedure, I thought I'd wake up and that all my problems would go away. If anything, I woke up and I felt like I did something really wrong and then face another problem of telling everybody that I didn't keep the baby. After the rumours had gone viral about paying somebody off, I think it was time for me to just come out and so I, I did that. I, I remained anonymous and I came out with the story just so that other women out there know that they can't just hide in the dark when this happens. Like if they're constantly being bullied or if someone's telling them that they can't have a child then they should speak up about it and not do what I did. Like I didn't do something about it at the time. Instead of opening my mouth about it, I just copped it every day and I, I wish if I could go back in time I could have done something about it. I could have, you know, reached out to other people. As soon as I woke up from the procedure, I didn't even get a phone call to find out if I was okay, if I was alive. It was, hey, he just wants you to know that the money's there. So really, as soon as I found out that that's all they wanted to do was make sure that the money was in my lawyer's account, I told my lawyer to donate to charity because I knew that what I had done was wrong and it was immoral and it's something that I'm gonna have to live with for the rest of my life. I didn't have any support from his end. I mean, my parents were very supportive and I had friends, but at that time I was too embarrassed to tell anybody that I had made the decision not to keep the child. I didn't have anyone there. I didn't wake up with anyone. Yeah, I was just by myself, basically. If he was there or just somebody was there, that would have been great, but I didn't want anyone there from my side because I was just too embarrassed. You know, after telling everybody that I was gonna have it, the guy that told me not to keep the baby was not even there. Like, it, it wasn't great but it just made me feel like there's this culture that I kind of have to fix or I kind of have to open my voice about because if it doesn't just happen to me, it's gonna to happen to somebody else. That's when I decided, you know, I, I need to tell my story. Yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of things in that, in that story that I could pull out and, and mention and, and a few that, I, that come to mind is, is the one where the separation, where um, the boyfriend is separating her from her family, those who love her. That's really common um, with abortion. We see that a lot. I had an a, um, 18-year-old girl come in once and she was pregnant and uh, her boyfriend was happy. His parents were happy, but her mother wasn't. Um, and initially when we talked to her, we thought, okay, well, everyone else is supportive, so we should be able to help you with this. But then she came back and said her mother had, um, had threatened to kick her out of the house, had also sacked her from the job that she was doing for her mum, so she was without money for that as well. Um, but then she'd also promised her a holiday in Bali and to buy her a car if she went ahead with the abortion. So we're looking at two tactics here, obviously. We're looking at, you know, the threat of abandonment and then also promises, and in this case too, promise of money to fix the problem. But really, who are they concerned about themselves? Even the mum, who's she concerned about herself? She's worried that she's going to have to help look after a child. Again, it's, it's, it's not concern for them. It's, concern, it's not concern, for, sorry, for the pregnant person. It's concern for their own, own life and what they are going to have to suffer Another um, girl that we had come in, she was, um, she was older and she was 16 week, weeks pregnant when she came to see us. And she said to us, look, I, I've, um, I've, I, I'd like help. I'd like you to t help me to tell my mum I'm pregnant. She said, because I, I've left it this long so that I can't have an abortion. I'm 16 weeks, so I, I just need help telling my mum. Well, unfortunately, her mum, after finding out, um, rung all the places in Perth to find out when the latest was she could have an abortion. And as Paul said, it was 20 weeks. So this girl then was pressured again by her mum, her own mum, to abort her child. So this is what we're calling choice. 
And that's what upsets me and gets me very angry. <laughs> um, because it's not really a choice if you are forced to do something against your will. And I've, I've found too that sadly, even when you've got a lot of supportive people, another girl who came in, she was um, pregnant to what she thought was a boyfriend. He actually wasn't um, from the other side of the story. He was just someone who saw her as a conquest and another one under the belt. So she was all in love with this guy. Her parents were supportive of her having the baby. Her sisters, um, her friends, they all came in together with her to see me. And um, while we're discussing it, it turns out that the only opinion she cares about is this boyfriend who's, who's not even a boyfriend, who doesn't care about her. And so, again, we're looking at another side of it. Women are also very hormonal and emotional when they're just pregnant. That's normal. So they're at a vulnerable stage already. And then to be given this added pressure is really, really difficult. So this is um, going on to another area, which is the medical, a bit of the medical side. Um, information from, for doctors from the Australian Medical Association. This is what it says in their little information book that, that they use. Um, so following a termination of pregnancy, women may experience a range of feelings such as relief, guilt, regret, anxiety, and sadness. For most of these react Sorry, for most women, these reactions are transistory and may last weeks or months. I've underlined that myself because I want you to remember this for when I keep reading some of these stories I'm going to read to you. Emotional problems resulting from abortion are uncommon and less frequent than those following childbirth. Again, my underlining there. For many women, the abortion is a method of coping with a personal crisis situation. So you can imagine if a woman came in to see a doctor and said she was pregnant, he wouldn't, have an, he wouldn't have a problem recommending abortion to her because he'd say, it's okay, you'll be fine. Um, I'll just turn, yeah, the next slide. If it can be, yep. So this is, this is a, um, a quote from a guy called David Ferguson, a New Zealander who's um, done some research into abortion and the effects it has on women. He actually was trying to prove exactly what that doctor's thing said, that abortion was fine and it didn't affect women at all. But actually what he found was the opposite. He found that those having an abortion had elevated rates of subsequent mental health problems, including depression, anxiety, suicidal behaviour and substance use disorders. Now there's been a lot of more, there's a lot of more studies to have been done on these sorts of things. Um, and they're often, if you, if you look on the media and things like that, they're often... Um, labelled as wrong because, it, you know, most of uh, mainstream media, mainstream, still don't want you to know about a lot of these things. So they're just looking at studies that have been done, whereas from my side, I've been looking at the personal stories I'm hearing. So I've got to, I'll just read this one to you from a lady. So three years ago, so note this, three years ago, this month I had a termination. Whilst it wasn't the easiest decision I'd ever made, I didn't think I agonised it over at the time. My husband and I discussed the options, but things were a bit rocky between us at the time, and it seemed that this, having another child, might be the thing that pushed us over the edge. We have two healthy boys, the youngest of whom had just started school. So I was finally seeing light at the end of the tunnel. Every now and then, I'd wandered through shops like Target, looking at little girl dresses and thinking how it might have been have, sorry, how it might have been to have, oh, it's her spelling here, <laughs> have had a daughter, but I didn't dwell on it. The abortion and everything on that day are things I'll never forget. The process was like being on a production line. Sit down, get a form, sit down, speak to a counsellor, sit down, have an ultrasound, sit down, move to another room, sit down, wait, wait, wait. Then finally it was done and I felt nothing. My husband and I both went in to see the counsellor. I vaguely wondered how she really knew if I wanted this and that my husband wasn't pressuring me. I thought it was strange not to be speaking to her alone. I don't even know why the thought crossed my mind, but it did. She wasn't that interested in the decision anyway, just in checking how this happened. I felt chastised, as though we were stupid somehow and this was the punishment. Her main focus was on making sure we knew how we had failed and that we were prepared to do what was necessary to make sure it didn't happen again. In the three years since, I've had up and down times. I've sometimes wondered if I did the right thing, 
but I haven't been beside myself with grief. Until now. A month ago, my younger sister gave birth to a baby. Their house is full of pink. I felt the first twinge when I went to Target to buy her a gift. As I admired and caressed tiny pink frills, I felt tears threaten, and then I felt panicked. Then it all hit what we had actually done. I've worked in a social welfare field my entire adult life. I've seen women make this decision dozens of times. I've seen some suffer afterwards, but I always firmly believed it was because of their religious conflict or some radical pro-life guilt trip. I never in a million years believed that their grief or sorrow was real or that their beliefs that they felt pressured were genuine. I felt no pressure toward abortion except by virtue of the fact that it seemed so normal, so available. At the time, I was a little annoyed I had to travel to Melbourne for it, two hours away, but it was only a minor inconvenience. Now I see things so differently. I'm only just beginning to understand that what I did was betray my unborn child. I'm a little numb about it right now. I'm not really sure where to go to talk to about it. I think about all the times one young client of mine used to want to cry to me about her baby and I would tell her about the choice she made and that it was valid and okay. I denied her her grief. Just as right now, I'm not able to face my own. Do I regret my abortion? Absolutely. Would I have made a different decision? Probably not because I had no idea this was possible, no idea that I would even think about it again let alone that I would feel so over overwhelmed at an indefinable sorrow in the middle of a Target store that I would panic. Regret looks very different to different people. Choice looks very different to me today than it did then. I would never advocate abortion to a woman. So that's one story <laughs> that I, I'm sharing with you tonight. Um, I feel it's a really good story because this is a story of a woman who, who didn't suffer it immediately as you can hear by her story. Going on to the next slide, we've got a list of some of the post-abortion symptoms. Interestingly, um, what, you, what I also um, know about post-abortion grief is that there's often triggers for it. So in this case, the trigger was her sister having a baby. Um, that was her trigger, then going into the target, looking at the clothes and thinking about that. Um, for some women, it's the birth of another baby. Um, for some women, it's the anniversary date of the abortion or the anniversary date of when the baby would have been due. So these are often triggers. So some people manage to close up and in denial for a long time. Um, I recently had a call from a woman um, and it took me a long time to get her to talk. And I started just asking her questions because she was silent and, and so I said, have you had an abortion? And she said, yes. Um, and, and she slowly opened up and we talked about it for quite a while and um, her pain was so raw and, and so heartfelt. And, um, and then I asked her, how long ago was your abortion? And she said, 12 years ago. And it was incredible how, whether she had... Look, we didn't, we didn't talk about all the details, whether she'd stuffed it down for 12 years or whether she'd been living like this for 12 years. It just showed me again how if it's not dealt with, if it's not worked through, it sits there. So these are, these are some of the post-abortion symptoms. Um, alcohol and drug abuse is, is quite common for those who feel the pain straight away. Um, and same with anxiety. So those who um, are aware of what they've done immediately, they will turn to what you call um, behaviours like to try and, and um, forget. And unnecessary risk-taking is a big one, so, and promiscuity also. Um, there's a feeling that, look, I've stuffed up, I'm, I've done this terrible, terrible thing, my life's not worth living. So they go in a, in a, in a cycle. This cycle also includes actually um, repeat abortions, as you can see. Because the other problem with um, women who've had abortions is that when, when they have an abortion and then they fall pregnant again, especially if they are being promiscuous, then they say to themselves, I killed the last baby, why does this one deserve to live? So they have that conflict as well, so then they can't even let their child live because they've killed their other child. It's so complicated, we're complicated people. Um, and when you start looking at the psychology of it, it's, it's really incredible. There are, as you can see here, there are common things, but there's also going to be differences. Um, 
I was actually also, I should also say that this does not include the actual um, physical effects of abortion either. I'm not going to go into that because that's, um, that's going to take a lot longer. But I was going to read another, hang on if I can find it here. Just another story um, from somebody who, who struggled. It was that bad. Drugs, mostly marijuana and alcohol, soon became my numbing of choice, along with increased promiscuity. Something in that experience changed me to my core. It was too much to even look at, so I didn't. It was 30 years before I was even aware. For me, my awareness came when I quit drinking, quit drugging and began attending 12-step meetings, which encouraged looking at our past and making amends, making things right where we can. 12-step meetings also were pivotal in introducing me to a God of my understanding. My abortion choice began coming up over and over and I did not believe I needed to even look at it. But it wouldn't stop. So I came clean to a trusted friend, thus beginning a brutally painful journey into healing. It was worth it. And why is something so spoken about in public, on TV and through politicians all day, every day, shrouded with so much secrecy and shame for the woman who actually does choose abortion? I was astounded through healing and admitting it out loud to discover what was buried under all those years of numbing, of shame and secrecy. I had laid down my childhood dreams. Instead of living, I was surviving. I had forgotten my desire to be a singer and songwriter. Once I had allowed the healing to come, the years of pent-up grief flooded my face for several months. But I started to play the guitar again after 30 years, to write and begin singing publicly. There weren't really phases for me. There was just numb, bury it and move on. But I really wasn't moving on. Two lives were lost that day. I think that's very poignant as well. As we often say, it's not just the baby who dies, the mother, in, in many ways, physically, emotionally, she suffers. Um, and I think, actually, the next slide, this, this quote, um, yeah, from the book, You're Not Alone. So not much has changed for women since abortion was legalised over 30 years ago. Most are still shocked, grief-stricken and traumatised today by what they were told and believed to be a quick fix to their crisis pregnancy as they were in 1973. This is an interesting thing too, because why do we think that abortion is a is a, a great modern choice you know we're free we can choose yes we do have a choice but at what cost and that's the question isn't it um i'll just read another because i realize the time's going <laughs> um i'll just read this little piece from a, a lady who who just, who talks about this immediately after her abortion so the Saturday and Sunday, I was absolutely fine. I guess you could say in denial. However, Sunday, I couldn't sleep and at 2 a.m. woke my partner up hysterically crying for hours. I've been like it ever since and just feel so cold and empty inside. I try to get on with just the day-to-day -day duties, but it won't go away. I can't switch off. I can't even sleep and even with strong sedative, nothing works. I don't ever post on things like this and I'm sorry for the essay. I just don't know how to cope or what to do anymore. So these are women looking for help, obviously, and, and this is a bit of a forum, a support group where they can write in, and, and which is a great, I think is a great avenue for women. Um, but I'll quickly go, because we're running on time, so I'll just go for the next slide. Um, just some, and Paul alluded to this as well, but this is just some research from America, because we don't really have a lot of statistics in Australia. Maybe Paul can help me with some more updated ones. But, yeah, 64% of women reported feeling pressured into having an abortion and 79% weren't told of the available resources. Most felt rushed or uncertain, yet 67% weren't counselled. 84% weren't sufficiently informed and 65% of women suffered trauma after the abortion. Again, these figures are, like I say, based on American statistics and it's, it's very hard to get accurate statistics because... In Australia especially, there's not a lot of reporting on abortion, especially afterwards. Um, there are some studies coming out of China now where there has obviously been a high rate of abortion, but a lot of those studies are focused more on the breast cancer risk and associated with abortion. But again, that's the physical side that I'm not going to talk about tonight. Um, next slide. Just Thank you. Um, and this is yeah a quote from a, a guy who wrote my message is that abortion is about oppression as it is as much about men oppressing women as it is about 
men and women aborting their children. As we've seen through some of these um, things, I'll just read this little one as well. Um, I've been experiencing deep depression, crying spells and self-hating thoughts. I told my boyfriend in the car in the parking lot of the clinic that I was concerned this would plunge me back into the depths of depression, that I was going to go to hell. Now looking back, he had no concern for my mental well-being. He just said, we're going to get through this together. It's what we needed to do. After the procedure, he was not supportive at all. Any time I cried, no reaction. Any time I said anything about it, no reaction. He was the only one who knew about it. I really wish I would have reached out and told anyone else so I could get that positive support I needed. Before I did something, I would regret forever. Just the next slide, please. Uh, it isn't just babies that are killed by abortion, but a part of every woman dies who has chosen this path. Uh, a pregnant woman should not be forced to choose between the conflicting wants and needs of herself and those around her. A woman's rights should and must include the right to bear children in a safe, loving and welcoming environment. Um, that's, I guess, where a pregnancy centre comes into play, where we would like to be able to help women in this situation. And we have, thankfully, been able to help a lot of women to have their children. Um, just recently, we had another baby born to a single mum who's doing really, really well. And it's very exciting to be part of that. So it's not, we don't just hear the pain, we also get the, the side that is, is positive. Um, I just also wanted to say that I can understand that this sort of information can be quite overwhelming. Um, and I hope I haven't upset or offended anyone tonight um, by sharing this. Um, but just be aware there's always a place and, a, and people who are willing to listen and who care. Thank you. We're going to start our Q&A, so we've got time to go through a number of questions that we've got. Anna Rogers is going to join us on the panel here now. Um, Anna has studied human services and worked, has worked as a high school chaplain for eight years. Many will know her in our church. She's the wife of Dan Rogers, one of our pastors. She's now the mother of Sebastian, who was born 12 weeks premature after being told that she should abort Sebastian due to her own health. Sebastian's now a happy, healthy three-year-old. So it's great to have someone with their own real-life story here on our panel. So thank you, Anna, for joining us. So we've, um, a number of questions are sort of similar, so I'm just going to sort of group those ones together. So even if it's not your exact question, it's the similar sort of theme of, of a question. So we'll just cover some biblical ones to start with. So Paul, you might like to answer this one. If you were to abort a child, what would A, God think of you for it, and B, how would the church view the mother? How should the church respond to those who have had an abortion or is considering an abortion? Good questions. So we know that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from our unrighteousness. So when we admit we've done wrong, God, God forgives us. Um, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our sin from us. So whether it's abortion or name your favourite sins, it makes no difference to God. He forgives unconditionally um, as a church we should extend that same grace um, we we love people we should get alongside them we should counsel them to protect the life that is within them we should give all the support that we can as a church and you know we know that the church hasn't always done that um, you know we've you know we can be as judgmental and condemning as anyone else but but that's not what we're called to do we're we're called to love and get alongside people so it should be a safe place to say to a woman we'll support you and congratulations regardless of the circumstances the baby's still a blessing and we're going to support you through that so so there's always a place of grace in the church isn't there so I think that's what we really need to be all the time that place of grace even when mistakes are made so yeah so this is just another technical one that, Lynn, you can probably answer. What is a late-term abortion compared to earlier? Uh, as in how it's performed or how late or...? 
I mean, late-term abortion would probably be 20 weeks and above, and in some states, up to 40 weeks. So there could be babies that are aborted a day before they're born, and that's perfectly legal in Victoria. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. And in Australia, does the father have a right to make the woman keep the child? Any rights at all? No. That's a very easy answer. No. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to ask Anna this one because she's been in this place. So what is your response to pregnancies that threaten the life of the mother and all child from both a Christian and secular point of view? And maybe share a little bit of something of your story in that, Anna. Um, yeah, so I was uh, encouraged at 16 weeks to have an abortion um, due to uh, I had a large blood clot and um, there was a high risk of hemorrhaging and bleeding out before getting to a hospital or things like that. Um, my response, it's hard for me to sort of say a Christian or a secular because I'm a Christian, so it's hard for me to sort of think of that. But one thing that I would say is that um, uh, sorry, doctors aren't always correct, <laughs> firstly. Um, we should trust our doctors and they go to medical school for a long time, but they're not always correct. And um, they work on often um, a risk-benefit analysis. And um, for myself as a Christian, um, my husband and I had talked about it. We were prepared because we knew that it would probably come up. Um, I have a heart condition, so it was something that was talked about from the very start for us. Um, and we um, personally felt like there was a difference between terminating and uh, ending a pregnancy and having life-saving surgery, if that makes sense. So if I was told, Anna, you need to have open-heart surgery and it could harm the baby, for us that was different to you need to terminate or else you will die. And we decided as Christians, that we were going to trust God. But there was also um, the word if in there was what I hung on to. You could hemorrhage, and if you hemorrhage, you could die. And so that's what I hung on to. Um, I think that sometimes women are faced with impossible decisions, and both lives are important. I don't know if that's answered it. Lynn, do you have anything to add? <laughs> Um, I echo what you say about um, errors. Doctors aren't perfect and in this day and age of suing, they are more likely to err on the side of let's just abort because I'm scared what could happen. Um, so there's a lot of mistakes with um, ultrasound as well where women are told your baby's got this or it's got that um, and the amount of stories you hear from people. Even my own doctor was told... Um, he said his wife had an ultrasound and they said, your baby's got a really big head, there's something wrong with it, she should abort. And he said no and he was vilified by his colleagues saying, you're terribly cruel to your wife, you're doing this, you're making her... He was born perfectly healthy and um, was 24 at the time when he spoke to me about it in uni, smart kid, nothing wrong with him. So, again, it comes down to personal choice and I don't think a woman should be pushed mm. by her doctor either. <laughs> Yeah, that was the other thing that I did want to say. That um, when I was uh, recommended, and it's always very heavily recommended to have an abortion, I was recommended um, a number of times over a number of days, and not once was I offered counselling. And so if you are supporting a woman in that situation, then I would say that they should get some outside counselling and a second opinion as well. Um, because it is a life and death situation and um, how can we make those choices without thinking it through? It's just given as um, this is an answer to the problem. This is an answer to the problem, try again instead of let's work through this, let's get counselling, let's support you through this. So that alternative choice is not always there? No. Yeah. That encouragement, yeah. So, um, uh, Lynn, you might want to answer this one. If abortion is made illegal, many people feel that abortions will still happen but will put people at greater risk due to backyard abortions, so to say. Is there a middle ground? Uh, I, th I think the premise of that is actually false. 
If we look at the fact that there's 8,000 abortions done in WA, do we suddenly imagine that there would be 8,000 backyard abortions done? I don't think so. Um, the other side of it is just because um, abortions are legal, they're not all safe and they're not all done in optimum situations. I've had a number of clients complain to me about the treatment they've received. Um, in fact, one lady called it inhumane, which is quite an interesting thing to say because it is inhumane because you're your child is dying, um, but generally they felt um, very badly treated, um, not well looked after. I've had a number of uh, ladies actually ask if they could sue the abortion clinic and I've said go for it, but none of them will because of course there's that shame and fear. One was called a wuss, another was told to stop crying. Um, there's so many stories I could tell you of these experiences that I don't think we've gone very far from backyard abortions to be honest with you. Um, most of the abortion clinics are, are still cold-hearted and look down on the women who actually come in to see them. There's a whole collection of questions which I'll ask um, Lynn and both Paul to answer, which are sort of similar in, uh, similar in, their, uh, in their intent about what if someone was raped, for example, or what if someone was young, very young child, 13, 11, something like that. What if they didn't have the mental capacity to understand what was happening. Um, how, how do you react to those situations? What would you say to people in those situations where the circumstances are horrific? Um, what would be your response to a, a number of different cases? So if you could both speak into that. Um, well, first of all, um, we're looking at it the, the wrong way around, I feel. Um, we're looking at it from the circumstances. We still have a child there. There's still been a child conceived, regardless of how it was conceived. So really what we need to look at is how, what is the best outcome in this situation. So in the case of rape, you're still dealing with a woman who is going to have to go through another trauma. Rape is a trauma. You want her to have an abortion? That's another trauma. Often... We, um, women who've been raped say that abortion is like a worse trauma because they've allowed it. We've got to look at it that way as well. The, the rape wasn't their fault, but the abortion was their choice. Um, there's a really good book called Victims and Victors, if you ever want to read it, about women who've, um, who've been through rape and had a baby and also been through incest and had a baby. And um, most of the women who, who went through and had their baby didn't regret it, but the ones who aborted did regret it. So it's a really good... Um, book if you ever want to read a bit more about it. But in the case of, say, a 13-year-old, 11-year-old, I would still say the best thing for that person is to continue the pregnancy, to get care um, and have a caesarean at the soonest possible stage so that the baby's viable, could be, you know, four weeks early, and to look after both of them. Because giving her an abortion, especially if it's a case of incest, incest is covered up by abortion. So men who, who prey on their daughters, bring them to the abortion clinic to cover up the incest. And the abortion clinic doesn't reveal this. I mean, I know in WA there's a case of, there's been at least, I think there was about 30 cases of women, um, well, girls, really, under 13 who were given abortions. Now, where is the reporting? Why aren't the police told? It's just another cover-up. So I don't support abortion in either of those cases. Yeah, the other thing is it's it's never, um, of course it's never the victim's fault, but um, rape is always the one that's mentioned in a forum like this. It's 0 0.1%, percent one tenth of 1% of all abortions actually for that that reason. and But everyone seems to get hung up on that one because it's the most dramatic, it's the most emotional. Um, two of my best friends are the... Are the proceeds of rape and they don't regret their life and their mothers don't regret having them. Now I know that's a straw poll of two but I see those two women and I see the families that have come from them. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's a terrible situation, it's highly charged but when that baby arrives um, they get through it and they thrive so we need to remember that. Actually there's redemption in the baby. Absolutely, yeah. I, I saw a, just a, when I was um, preparing for tonight, I just randomly came across a picture and it had three little babies sitting side by side and, and the caption simply said, which one of these is the product of rape? They're both th they're three beautiful children. 
does it does it matter how they were conceived they're still beautiful children with who are loved by god made in his image still have a purpose and a plan um yeah i suppose that's where there's need for a lot of support though isn't there and oh, that's absolutely. where absolutely yeah, yeah that's where people need to get the encouragement of where to go at least have some options so that they can consider what happens after that yeah and so what about that you do a lot of that work lynn what about around the place what other organizations what else is happening in that space that just tell people about or oh, paul for for what for the yeah all of those things because i guess that's where people need to go, go to don't they and that's where emily's voice has its place really that people can hear that there is hope and there's other options yeah because so I our, think, yeah. yeah our goal is to get people to go to notbornyet.com where they can find, we basically want to take them on a journey, pique their interest through the advertising, take them to the website. And one of the things that we have on there is if you have an unplanned pregnancy or a, a suffering post-abortion grief, we, we um, facilitate or we uh, conduit to pregnancy support centres such as, such as Lynn. So we just point to them and we refer women to those and they do the actual ministry and, and counselling of those women. There's not nearly enough centres... When you compare how many abortion clinics there are to how many support centres there are, yeah. Yeah. Um, you can see that we need a whole lot more and we also need the church to stand up. The church yeah. needs to be a pregnancy support centre. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and getting alongside a woman, woman in that situation in terms of friendship and support and then referring her to the appropriate counselling, that's our, that's our job. Actually, that um, question on the screen, Lynn, might be good for you. Have you counselled anyone who had an abortion due to a pregnancy caused by rape? I'm sure you have. Do these people grieve differently or have more of a sense of relief? So you sort of answered that, but maybe just answer it more into um, that question. No, actually, I can't say I have counselled anyone who's, who's actually had an abortion after rape. Um, like Paul said, it's quite rare. Um, and so, yeah, it, a lot of the, the, this is it, my work is rather mundane, <laughs> if you want to say it like that. I don't see the 13-year-old pregnant people. I don't see the rape ones. I don't see those. I see the everyday 24, 25-year-olds who come in because their husband left and they're pregnant. Um, the ones who, yeah, um, got pregnant and um, actually I saw a couple who were pregnant and they thought they couldn't afford the baby because they'd just been told that. So uh, I don't see the unusual cases. I think most of the time um, these people that... It, the, the bigger majority are everyday people like you and me um, who are concerned they're going to lose their career or who... Their concerns aren't big things often and, and that's also why it's really good if we can be a support as a church because I often ask them if they have support and if they don't, I mention... Have you considered going to a church um, and, and going to find some support? Because a lot of them are lonely. They don't have parents to help them. So they feel like they can't do this on their own. And I think for us, the biggest thing is no men in their life, um, men who've abandoned them, or, um, yeah, just feeling very overwhelmed and no support, actually, no community. So this is fairly similar along the same sort of line, but... Um uh, slightly different. What about a severe mental health issue with the mother? Maybe, Paul, do you want to speak into that? Yeah, the, the answer's the same. Yeah. Yeah. We, she we needs help and support and she needs to be, yeah, counselled and coached through the whole thing. Yeah. We, we actually did have a case like that um, and we supported her and her boyfriend, I believe. In the end, the baby was removed from their care simply because um, they actually couldn't understand nurturing. So they were feeding the baby and doing all the right things, but the baby wasn't thriving because they weren't holding it and cuddling it. Um, but that baby's gone on to another family and is being well cared for. So it's, it, again, it's not the child that should have to pay. And it's, it's not her fault either that she had this mental impairment. But social services were aware and they gave them a chance to try, but it didn't work out. So, Again, it's the support around this sort of thing. 
Um, Paul, this one is about the government issue. Australian governments are currently spending hundreds of millions of dollars on research to expand prenatal testing for inherited diseases in the unborn. How should Christians' parents respond to pressure from doctors to test the genes of their unborn children? Oh, that's a, that's a big question. <laughs> that's a, um, oh, goodness. Yeah, f yeah. For me, it does. I don't think we should get tested. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, please, right? go ahead, save me. I'm not <laughs> skilled. Um, I think um, it kind of depends on why you're doing the testing. Yeah. So for me, um, with the testing for Down syndrome, um, my obstetrician said, will you get an abortion if it's a Down syndrome baby? I said no, so he said, don't do the testing. Um, but I know for some women, it's a way of preparing themselves. Yeah. So if you're doing it to go, okay, I want to prepare the best schools or yeah. the best support or anything like that, then cool, maybe the testing is for you. But if, it's, if you're like me and it's just going to freak you out, then probably just enjoy your pregnancy. And once again, it's not, it's not foolproof. If my mum had had an ultrasound when she was pregnant with me, she didn't. She lived in Papua New Guinea. But if she had, of, she would have been told that I was incompatible with life because of my heart condition. Um, and obviously that's not true because <laughs> I'm alive. <laughs> um, so it's not foolproof. Um, and I guess it's, it's not wrong to get the testing. Um, but once you, why are you getting the testing? And also beware that if you get that testing and any problems or disabilities are showing up, then the pressure to abort is going to be a hundredfold. Um, and so you've got to be able to withstand that pressure as well. So I don't think there's anything biblically wrong with finding out. But it's what you do with it and it's how you're going to handle the pressure afterwards from the medical people but also from your friends and family as well. That's a good one because you've got your, both, both yourself, you would have been perhaps encouraged, your mum would have been perhaps yeah. encouraged to abort you and then your own son. So here you've got two generations that might not have been here and we're thankful that you are. <laughs> yeah. This on the, is a very similar sort of question really but um, you might just want to be more specific. People say if your child has a disability, Down syndrome, you should abort. What are your views on that? I think you've sort of answered it, but it'd be good just to clarify again for a question there. Um, well, I know some really, really beautiful Down syndrome children, so <laughs> to me that's just ridiculous. I mean, my daughter, both my daughters had one in their class, and I think it's the best thing that ever happened to them. Um, as my one daughter wrote a whole essay on it, she wrote, he's not, um, what she, how'd she say it? He's not... He's not a person who has Down syndrome. It's more he is who he is, but he's got this funny little, you know, extra thing that makes him special. She loves him. So I think our world would be a poorer place without these children. And um, I think if, I, if I'm listening to all these comments we're talking about, I think our biggest issue is selfishness. We've got mothers who don't want to help their children have babies. We've got a society that doesn't want to help anymore so down syndrome they need help and we're just too selfish and i think ultimately that's where we're running into this whole idea of let's just get rid of all these difficult children difficult babies um our life will be so much easier but yet where would the joy be one um, one of the ladies that speaks for us she has a she's the head of the down syndrome association in tasmania has obviously has a child with down syndrome she did a research report and found that women who um, were given a diagnosis of Down syndrome on average were told five times or more throughout the pregnancy that they needed to have an abortion. They were also given wrong information, outdated information about Down syndrome. So what she did, she took her information to the Anti-Discrimination Commission and she, um, she got a ruling and they demanded that all medical staff be retrained to... And one, one of the key things, it's only, it might sound like a minor thing, but she said that one of the, the language used around Down syndrome or any other disability is um, um, the odds. Um, oh, sorry, the risk, 
your risk of getting heart disease or your risk of having a child with Down syndrome or whatever. And she pointed out that risk is only ever associated with a poor outcome, your risk of getting whatever. She said, but when we talk about lotto, we talk about your chance of winning. Minor thing, but she just said, when risk is always associated negatively. And so he just, he said it was actually um, discriminatory to talk about children with disabilities in that, in that term in order that it be changed, so, yeah. Again, I guess a lot of the time it's just fear of the unknown, isn't it? Yeah, um, I know for my sister had a child that had a very rare genetic condition and she lived till she was just under two years of age. And probably, I mean, they would say, my, my sister and her husband, who have now got three other children, but they only, that was their first child, would say that that baby was the best thing that ever happened yeah. to them. It was the most joyful, one of the most joyful times in their lives yeah. as they learnt to care for a vulnerable child and just love and, yeah. Melinda tankard Reese, which Lynn um, mentioned before, has a book out called Defiant Birth and it's all about medical eugenics and women told not to um, have babies or to abort because of disabilities and things like that. And it's real life stories. And um, in many of the cases, the doctors were wrong. And in many of the cases, the doctors were right. And even in the cases where the doctors were right and the women gave birth to um, stillborn babies or babies that died right after birth, they talked about how they were able to nurture and care for that baby for nine months, how that wasn't taken from them, that privilege of being able to do that and being able to hold their child, um, bury their child and all of that sort of stuff and how that was a time of grief, but there was also um, love and joy in that. Whereas when we um, terminate pregnancy because of incompatibility with life or disability, there's no really love and joy, it's just grief. Um, and so we're taking away that opportunity to have, um, even, if it's, even if it's nine months, that opportunity to have that child. Um. This, I don't know where they, there are this, but are there any statistics for those regretting having their baby rather than aborting? No, know? there isn't, and that's, that's what a great comment. So where, where are all the people lining up to tell us that they've got these children that they wish they didn't have? Yeah. There aren't. There's no movement for that. They don't trot them out when they talk about abortion. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, good. it's illogical. Good. Um, just before we finish, because the time's gone, I might just get um, Paul to answer this. It's about Emily's voice and support. Who is Emily? As part of Emily's voice, what is your continued care for mothers who, d who do choose to abort? Or do you let them slip through the cracks? And how do you show love to women who choose to abort? Yeah, so Emily was just the most popular girl's name the year we started. That's how <laughs> scientific it was. Okay. Yeah, yeah, there is no Emily. Yeah, she's not, she's not a special girl. Um, but what we didn't know when, we, when they started Emily's Voice, because it pre, predates me, is that there is another organisation called Emily's List, yeah. which is an acronym, Early Money is Like Yeast. Started in the States, came, was brought to Australia and is the Labor Party's women's movement. And so to be an Emily's Lister, of which Tanya Plibersek is, uh, and many of the many of the senior women labor politicians they are funded to get elected to office on the proviso that they are pro abortion and so we just think it was quite prophetic and providential that we were called emily's voice because if we started it again we'd call it, call ourselves emily's voice yeah and again, just um, in finishing, it'd be good. Nick Garan encouraged us last week, if we want to have a say, go to our local politicians. So as we see um, things come up in the media about things that are happening in terms of abortion, we can have a say if we go and speak to our local politicians. And there's something we can do right tonight or tomorrow, and that is there is a push to have exclusion zones around abortion clinics so you can't pray or approach women. Um, nicely and sensitively and uh, they exist now in Tasmania, in the ACT, in New South Wales uh, and in Queensland. Uh, they want to bring it here. So if you go to righttolifewa.com.au, you can fill out a form that will go to the politicians expressing your concern about that. Now I don't think we should 
harangue and I don't think we should call out call women murderers and baby killers and all those horrible things that do nothing to help women um, but you should be able to pray quietly outside an abortion <laughs> clinic and give a woman a form or a, a pamphlet that that's that offers some hope that offers a you know help to a pregnancy support center um, oh, and the other answer to the question is we we are really we don't counsel women we are simply a conduit to pregnancy support centers all of whom do post-abortion grief counseling as well as parenting and um, pregnancy testing and practical care so it's both sides so a woman that has an abortion she'll be welcomed back and cared for without judgment condemnation but with great love and respect so i wonder if we might just thank paul and lynn and anna again for sharing with us this evening being part <laughs> sorry i always have to have the last word I stumbled on the genetic, genetics question only because I got caught up on whether we should be spending money on doing genetic testing. I don't believe that, that any child that has a disability should be aborted. Like Anna said, I, I believe that if you want to find out because it prepares you, you should do so. I don't think you should ever use that diagnosis to, uh, to end the life of, a, of an unborn child. But I have a son that works for Cerebral Palsy Alliance. And I know that it is a condition that can't be diagnosed in the womb. But they're trying to find, um, they're trying to do the research. Where I get caught is I know that, that they're doing the research because they'll be able to tell women, oh, we know you're having a child with um, cerebral palsy and that uh, you may want to consider your options. Whereas at the moment, they don't know, the child gets born and Cerebral Palsy Alliance does a fantastic job looking after the, the women and the children. So, yeah, I just wanted to clarify that. I'm not, I'm not in favour of getting rid of children that have disabilities at all, ever. Thanks, Paul, for clarifying that. We probably thought yeah, you were... You well, well, thought <laughs> just, uh, just in case. <laughs> so just to let you know in finishing that the podcasts of these last four evenings will be available on the um, church website. Um, Sometime towards the end of this week, Marcus, who does this sort of work, is not being well, so it'll just depend when he's available. But I'd just like to thank everyone who's come and been a part of these last four evenings as we discuss these important and often difficult issues. And yesterday I read in um, the devotional that I read, The Way of Wisdom by Timothy Keller, these words, and I thought they were quite apt, really. In order to live wisely in our present culture of self-promotion fake news, alternative facts and the overthrow of reason, the ability to discern evil disguised as good could not be more important. And I think that's it. It's often evil disguised as good. And unless we have a really good Christian worldview or a good view of what life's really about, that it's not about having a perfect child, for example, then we can think something is good, but it's not really good. So... I just thought that was we actually need great wisdom in the world in which we live. And as Dan Patterson reminded us a few weeks ago, we need to know what story we're a part of and live into that story, not the cultural story. But for most of us, I'm assuming the Christian story, which means we may need to be like Jesus, who held together both a conviction of truth but also compassion. He stood for truth, but not in a legalistic and a harsh way. He was also filled with compassion. And we're called to stand for truth, but also be the restoring, compassionate, kind community for people who have broken. So I trust that's how we'll endeavour to live, full of the conviction of Scripture, examining it more and more to know what we stand for, but also living out the compassion of Jesus and not being judgmental to others who might have differences of opinion. So I wonder if you might just join me in prayer um, as we close this evening and this series. So Lord, we thank you for these speakers we've had over the last four weeks and particularly thank you for Paul and Lynn this evening. Thank you for Lynn coming, coming all the way up from Albany, Paul coming from Queensland. Pray that you would take them back safely um, to where they live and thank you for Anna sharing with us too. Pray that you would bless strengthen and equip 
both Lynn and Paul as they serve in this place and Anna as she speaks um, for Emily's voice. And as they seek to make your truth known about what it means to be human in the midst of the culture in which we live, Lord, enable them to do that well and to be good supporters of those who need help. And we pray the same for all those other speakers who have come over the weeks and are those who seek to make your truth known within the time in which they live. Lord, would you give us courage to engage in our world thoughtfully, compassionately and confidently and to live out your truth even when it costs us. As we heard from Lynn tonight, sometimes it's selfishness that makes us not want to go that extra mile. So help us to live out your truth even when it costs us something to walk alongside others uh, and to endure um, difficult times. So Lord, thank you for these times and for being with us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So thank you and God bless.